this week we've been having beans and squash out of the garden. And they're the best I've ever tasted. And I said to my sister, you know, in the city you put a lot of spices and herbs on food, but you really don't need it. I don't think people even realize that food is so good out here. This is the story of a remarkable woman who wrote a cookbook back in 1976 that put American Southern cooking on the international culinary map. Her name is Edna Lewis, and the book she wrote is not just a list of recipes, but a celebration of a simpler and purer way of life, where everything revolved around the preparation of local, healthy, fresh, flavorful food that was picked in the season. Spring would bring our first and just about only fish, shad. It would always be served for breakfast, soaked in salt water for an hour or so, rolled in seasoned cornmeal, and fried carefully in home-rendered lard with a slice of smoked shoulder for added flavor. There were crispy fried white potatoes, fried onions, batter bread, any food left over from supper, blackberry jelly, delicious hot coffee, and cocoa for the children. Edna Lewis's story is told by her niece, Nina Williams Mbenge, and Edna's sister, Ruth Lewis Smith. It was always fun to go searching for nuts and berries, to have the men bring in some game in the fall or the first fish of spring, all of which not only added to our regular supply of food, but always brought something festive to the table. The Edna Lewis story is also told by her friend and fellow cook, Chef Joe Randall, who continues to carry her torch by establishing the Edna Lewis Foundation. Because she was the queen or the, the grand dam of Southern cooking and uh, still is, in my opinion. You know, nobody's taken it from her. And the story is told from a series of interviews recorded in the summer of 1984 when Edna herself described growing up in the rural community of Freetown in Orange County, Virginia. This is where she was born, and to understand her, we must go back to her rural roots and her first childhood memories of making mud pies and chasing fireflies. I guess the early thing were the baby chickens that were given us, and we had to feed them. And it came to a point where they had to be killed, and, and we didn't, maybe, I don't think we even complained about it, because we knew that these things had to be killed so you could eat. Freetown was an idyllic community of 11 families where everyone got along, everyone pulled his or her share, and everyone helped everyone else. If you didn't have any butter, say some people's cow would dry up, and then, so they, my mother would give them a pound of butter. They returned it, they would return two pounds. <laughs> if you borrowed a cup of sugar, they would return two cups. <laughs> if someone was ill, fell ill, then my aunt and uncle had the flu. Then the neighbors would go in and milk the cows and feed the chickens and clean the house and cook the food and come at night and sit up with you if someone was sick. It was great. I never met any people like them. I guess rural life was more conducive to that kind of life because you had to have someone to help you get up your hay. You didn't hire anyone. You, you um, cooperated with your neighbors. They used your tools and you used theirs. Freetown was founded by her grandfather, an emancipated slave, who, although illiterate himself, recognized the value of education by making his living room available as the community's first school. The first thing they knew that the children had to be educated and that's what they set out to do. And her grandfather helped establish Bethel Baptist Church just up the road from Freetown. Throughout her life, she and other members of her family who had moved away would come back, always in August, for revival, a week-long celebration of feasting, faith, and family at the height of the growing season. Father, go to mercy. 
What did thine only son endure before we drew our breath? What pain and labor to secure our souls from endless death? My father would drive straight up to one of the long tables that were stretched out in a line under the huge shady oak trees alongside the church. My mother would spread out a white linen tablecloth before setting out the baked ham, the half dozen or more chickens she had fried, a large bacon pan of her light, delicate corn pudding, a casserole of sweet potatoes, fresh green beans flavored with crisp bits of pork, and biscuits that had been baked at the last minute and were still warm. It was here in Freetown that Edna Lewis developed her love of locally grown, pesticide and preservative free food long before such phrases as grow local, eat local and earth to table had become so popular. When you talk about country cooking and you're talking about being out in the country, well what is the country? That means rural. Well the entire south primarily was dealing with the rural part of this in the country. And so when we talk about southern food, we're talking about food that is either grown either trapped, shot, or hunted for, or caught on the line. But it wasn't about running to the supermarket. There were, you know, if you had a loaf of bread, somebody had to take the time to make it. Edna Lewis disdained modern conveniences such as food processors and the like, wouldn't touch chemically preserved food, said that convection ovens ruined pastry. She even turned up her nose at freezers, adding we rely on refrigeration far too much. Down home. We had a spring at the foot of the hill. And that's where we kept perishable food. You didn't have no ice. You had ice later on, but you didn't have an ice box. And she distrusted hybrid seeds, saying they produce vegetables that look good, travel well, but taste like cardboard. And she complained that the food doesn't have the same texture and quality now. It's become hybridized. You know, it doesn't need to cook as long, but that's why you had that long cooking of those greens. And when you overcook them now, they're just that, they're overcooked because they're hybridized, they're softer, they don't have as much fiber. And she complained about that. She thought the food probably had more, was more nutritious. And if it's an organic, it's got to be more nutritious um, uh, with, with, you know, and, and to prepare the foods with as many natural products and ingredients as possible. I, I always felt that, you know, um, being in Virginia in the summer and listening to Aunt Edna that the um, folks were healthier because they were, you know, they were doing more physical work and the food was always fresh from the garden. All the time it had just been picked that day, even the animals, they raised them their, themselves. They hadn't used any chemicals, uh, you know, to feed the, the pigs or the hogs or the chickens and the turkeys and geese and ducks and things like that. And they were running around what they call now free range, but they were just, you know, they were running around the yard and the woods and they tasted different, and they tasted better. And the eggs tasted different, they looked different. And I think that affected all the food and make it, made it taste so much richer and so much more delicious. We would learn something now if we could go back and raise everything we ate, because you wouldn't have all this cancer. You eat food that's you know, in the season, and then of course that means it's fresh. It's not, you know, it's not been transported or stored or frozen or filled up with chemicals to make it last, but it's, you know, prepared fresh. You get all the nutrients and all the flavor, too. And it should be that way now, you know, although there is spring in Chile and New Zealand, but by the time it get here, it lost some of its savor. When Edna Lewis was 12 years old, her parents moved the family out of Freetown to establish their own farm. We had all the contact we would ride home and we'd come home in the summer and at Christmas time. And, and we, I don't think we feel we ever left <laughs> because uh, we had such close relationship. And then the people began to die. And that was uh, really sad. The next, the second generation needed more money. <laughs> and the second generation also needed to expand. I recall Edna being very busy, loving to do nice things. She loved to cook. She was good in whatever she did. 
She loved to work in the garden, and she did whatever she could in the way of helping when it was hog killing or canning and whatever my mama had for us to do. I can remember when they went to school, they left on time and came home on time. They were busy all of the time. And we studied our lesson by kerosene lights at night. Edna dropped out of school at age 14 and did about the only thing young black girls could do back then, which is become a domestic servant. Yes, Edna Lewis was the help. First for a local white family, then for a family in Washington, then on to New York at age 19, where she stayed with trusted relatives. Her first job in the Big Apple, ironing shirts, lasted three hours. She found instead she had a talent for making clothes, not ironing them. Something of a Renaissance woman, she did everything. In no particular order, she dabbled in haute couture by copying Dior dresses for the wife of Richard Avedon. She designed display windows for Bonwit Teller, worked as a guide in the African Hall of the Museum of Natural History, where she developed a lifelong love of all things African. She even owned a restaurant in Harlem and a pheasant farm in New Jersey. At one point in all this, she met and married a retired merchant seaman and avowed communist, Stephen Kingston. And she wrote for the radical newspaper, The Daily Worker, which is interesting considering the fact that she grew up in the seemingly perfect communal society of Freetown. And after her husband died, that was out of her life. And her life just took off as a chef, being able to cook anywhere. In the late 1940s, she met antiques dealer Johnny Nicholson, who, with photographer Carl Bissinger, established Cafe Nicholson, first on 52nd Street, later on 58th in New York City on what was known as Writer's Row. It became a wildly popular bohemian hangout, attracting the likes of such luminaries as Truman Capote, Salvador Dali, and Tennessee Williams. Edna's specialties included mussels and roast chicken. And I also remember Mrs. Roosevelt and many, many uh, highfalutin people came there to eat. They didn't have a big menu, but the menus were really very nice. Uh, one thing she did, she would cook squash, sauteed it in a pan, and she would do liver and fish. And her other favorite was um, souffles. That was one of the desserts. It could be cheese souffle or chocolate souffle. And she did a lot of shrimp. I remember having to clean those for her. By the early 1970s, Edna Lewis was living in an apartment in the Bronx. One day, she slipped in the snow and broke her leg. Lying in bed, bored to tears, she started to compile a collection of favorite recipes she'd learned from her mother in Freetown. The result, the Edna Lewis cookbook. Her sister, Naomi, also living in New York, was stricken by tuberculosis. She sent her daughter, Nina, to live with her Aunt Edna while she recuperated. Nina was 12 years old at the time, was taking a typing class in school. Her Aunt Edna handed her a sheaf of papers on which were scrawled the beginnings of the taste of country cooking. She always wrote in, in hand in uh, her script, which was really hard to read. We used to call it chicken scratch. It was a big joke between us. And I think I, had, I must have just learned how to type in uh, junior high school. That's what we called it back then. <laughs> and she always wrote her recipes on these long yellow legal pads like this. And we would spend hours. I would often wouldn't understand what she was writing. And I'd ask Ann, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by this? You already said that. And I, that's how I typed up the manuscript for her. And I think it took us about, um, I started age 12 till I was about age 14, something like that. No, I just remember all the recipes, all her me remembrances of growing up in Virginia and writing all this down. Because it was more than just recipes, it was the whole way that they lived and how they raised the animals and how they planted crops. Um, and what everything meant and how important all this was and how the whole year was laid out seasonally and uh, based on what the animals were doing and how, you know, when they were planting the crops and what the weather was like. Little did Nina realize she was typing a culinary masterpiece. As luck would have it, the editor at Knopf was the legendary Judith Jones, the same editor who discovered Julia Child. It may have been she who coaxed out those lyrical passages about a pastoral life in Freetown where everything revolved around the gathering and preparation of food according to the season. But it was always wonderful working with, you know, 
being with Aunt Edna and just hanging around with her and all the things we did together. This was part of it. Testing the recipes in our oven and on the stove, you know, that was great. And in the summertime, I'd be on vacation. I would come to Virginia and she'd be at her sister um, Jenny's house, Aunt Jen. And they would, you know, reminisce and she'd write down more things as part of the whole process of putting the book together from being with Aunt Jen. And they'd go and they'd go pick, we'd go pick blackberries and they'd talk and reminisce about growing up and learning how to cook from the people in Freetown. And that went into the book as well. And she did away with this notion that soul food is just fried chicken and really greasy greens and cornbread and uh, pig's feet. But it's everything that these farm families prepared, you know, that, you know, that they were the animals they were growing and all the things that they prepared and that they built, they fed their families and they built communities on this wonderful fresh food that's so much more than, you know, what we think of. And it has formed the basis of a different way of looking at food. It's almost a, a foundation of Southern cooking, not just, you know, a book. And when I say that, it's clearly when you understand what I alluded to earlier from the garden or from the, 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 the farmer's field to your house to processing to canning whatever process the family used to preserve it so that it would be there when you needed it that book talks about that and there weren't a lot of books speaking of it from the heart as she did and that's why the book started out a little quiet, a little slow. But 20 years later, it was still standing. Now, 30 years later, it's still standing because it was real. As the book gained in popularity, Edna's star began to rise. Robert Mondavi flew her out to California just to prepare a lunch. She cooked for a thousand guests at a James Beard Foundation dinner. Never one to self-promote, she was actually quite shy, belying her magnificent presence. Seemingly six feet tall, she had long, smooth, sinewy, copper-colored limbs, huge, powerful hands, and she always dressed in her trademark African print dresses with long, dangling earrings. She tied her snow-white hair back in a neat bun. Her high cheekbones, slightly almond-shaped eyes bore testimony that her great-grandmother was Native American Indian who had been rescued and adopted by slaves. In the beginning, blacks were really the only cooks, and they are the ones that developed uh, the food of the South, which they call Southern hospitality. That was done by black men. There were many black men in home kitchens. They were in the hotels, they were in the railroad, they were on boats and boarding houses. And through their cooking, they developed techniques and flavor, and, and they call it the great southern food. And then uh, World War II, well, the Depression came, and people hardly had food to eat. And then the World War II, so a lot of the, uh, the men, of course, went off to war. And the women did too. They went to work in the war plants. And they left the big children home to take care of the little ones. And they never came back. So while they were out in Kentucky Fried Chicken and all those uh, fast food places, and young people that grew up with the mothers out working didn't have a chance to learn from the older people because uh, they were truly, and they truly produced the only regional cuisine in this country is the Southern cuisine, fully developed. African Americans have been the backbone of Southern cooking from the beginning. Now, I'm here in the South. I have lots of clients that come, and some of the younger ones who don't know the history challenge me. And they say things like, well, I've been eating black eyed peas all my life. My mother used to cook them, and I say, who taught your mother? Or my grandmother, well, who taught your grandmother? See, or we were poor, we couldn't afford no house, no cook, or no servant. But it didn't take a lot. People forget. Somebody come and work all day at your house just to get the scraps to take home to feed their family. Everybody made a contribution. You know, there's an English contribution to Southern cooking. There's a German contribution. There's a Jewish contribution. But the African Americans were the ones that was in the kitchen. The only place in the country that had a complete cuisine from appetizer to dessert was the South. 
and that's where it had built her foundation about food from the very beginning. At one point in her career, Edna Lewis was asked to teach a cooking class in New York. She had her brother, a lifelong farmer in Virginia, pack in ice a whole hog with its innards and ship it to her by rail. On the first day of class, her urban and urbane students were shocked to find the hog laid out on a marble slab. She taught them you can use every part of the animal except the oink. Those people don't even know that chickens have feet, she scoffed. Edna Lewis went on to become the executive chef at Farrington House near Chapel Hill, North Carolina, served as a consultant to Middleton Place outside of Charleston, and worked for five years at Gage and Tallner Restaurant in Brooklyn. During that period, she penned her third cookbook, In Pursuit of Flavor, also published by Knopf. In the early 1990s, Edna Lewis came out of retirement and partnered with a young Atlanta chef named Scott Peacock. Known as the Odd Couple of Southern Cooking, they co-authored The Gift of Southern Cooking. But nothing has surpassed her seminal work, The Taste of Country Cooking, which has now come out in hardback with a foreword by Alice Waters. She became someone that everybody could legitimize their comments by quoting it. Craig Claiborne did it at the New York Times. James Beard did it in his writings. They all would say, Edna Lewis said, Edna Lewis said, Edna Lewis said. So that made whatever they were saying legitimate. Author of four cookbooks honored by chefs associations and foundations worldwide, a recipient of Le Grand Dame de Scoffier Award, holding an honorary doctorate degree from Johnson and Wales University, restaurant owner, caterer, consultant. How Edna Lewis wanted to be remembered is as a cook. She didn't like to be called chef. Edna Lewis may have been the single most important person in this country to give American Southern cooking its rightful place in the world of haute cuisine. She helped give not just Southern cooking, but all American regional cuisine an identity to call its own. And she was among the first to talk about locally raised fresh food that was gathered, prepared, and consumed in the season. What she did really translated into what her life was. What she started doing as a young person, coming up a decent life here in Virginia, and how it carried off through. But family was always important to her. When you know everybody like you, I think you feel bad about yourself. Well, young people don't stay put and before they know it they're married and have children and can't and if you read Thomas Wolfe you can't go home again <laughs> and I think it's true as Edna grew into her 80s she became increasingly frail diagnosed with Alzheimer's her bright star dimmed and then died but Edna finally did come home in February of 2006. She's buried a stone's throw away from Freetown, where her incredible story began 89 years prior. Oh, I loved walking barefoot behind my father in the newly plowed furrow, carefully, carefully putting, putting one, one foot, foot down, before, down the before the other and pressing it into the warm plowed earth, so comforting to the sole of my feet. <laughs> 